so uh, if what else? So we believe that we have found what we call nanothermite. Let me repeat. You have a plastic matrix, and in it, you have very finely dispersed aluminum and iron oxide, and that's it. The methods of preparation has already been, 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 been um, described by Kevin Ryan, but now I'll meet one objection which is, has been met over the last two years, that th this is just ordinary paint. And uh, no, it isn't, I can say. Because the paint, the primer paint applied on World Trade Center, uh, as you see it here, this is what you do to steel when it comes, when you, you, you apply paint on it immediately for anti-corrosion purposes. And but the primer paint is also red because it does indeed contain also iron oxide, which is red. Uh, this is a sample from the NIST report, very specifically isolated, you see the primer paint, and from the towers. But the same report also contains a description, a chemical description of what the composition of the primer paint is. And now I have to be a little technical. This is from the NIST report. And, the, and besides, these are all the liquids. You don't have to worry about that. But the hard stuff in there is iron oxide. It is yellow. And then it's a compound called zinc yellow, which to the trained scientist, we know it's, its true name is zinc chromate. And it is indeed lemon yellow. Uh, so if you... And this, of course, are percentages from the wet paint, which just the only thing here which is not immediately understandable is what the dynamic pigment, but, but what this 33% is, you can find if you go into material safety data sheet of the dynamic paint, and you can find out these are very small compound uh, content of zinc, iron oxide fume. You do a little calculation, and you find out it's very easy that the con that the content of zinc chromate in the dry paint is about one third. Now the point here is we do not see thing zinc. We do not see it. I go back to a picture I showed you a couple of minutes ago of the energy dispersive spectroscopy from the red layer here, and I, here we have blown up the area where you should expect chromium. You can see a little chromium, chromium here. We just cannot see zinc. And when you blow up the vertical scale, of course, all the, what you call it, the regular peaks, they go completely out off the roof. So the signal from chromium is the level of the noise. It means there's nothing in there. And we can't even see zinc. So conclusion here is that the red red chips cannot be the primer paint because we do not see zinc chromate. Now then, maybe somebody who has went into our paper, uh, we, I'm just telling the experience for the, that we have had uh, uh, with the debunkers. And they, they, they fell down of one of the pictures in the paper here, which shows the chip which was used for the swelling experiment with methyl ethyl ketone. I say, ha, you see here, here you have chromium and here you have zinc. That is proof that it's a primer paint. The point here is that the previous picture, these EDSs have been taken on chips which have been broken. So you have a clean surface, which is the way to do it. Now, in the experiment, where we had to put the chip into methyl ethyl ketone, we could not break it, of course. So this is actually, it shows all the contamination from the rest of the building. Let me just point out here, you see a great big sulfur peak, and you see calcium is big. We have already talked about wallboard. This is contamination of calcium sulfate from the wallboard, which was all over. And and this zinc chromate could very well be primer paint. 
sticking on the outside of the red grade chips. And the point is, when you break the chip, where you get a clean cut, there is no zinc chromate. That is one reason that the red grade chips is not the primer paint. Another one argument depends on the thermal stability of the primer paint. Because already you may think, why should somebody paint World Trade Center with a paint which reacts violently at 300, uh, 430 degrees centigrade? Yes, that is true. And even in the NIST report, they used the thermal stability, or you may say rea reactivity, of the, of the primer paint as a measure for the temperatures for which the steel beams have been exposed. They, did act they, they took actually a steel beam, put it into an oven, and, and saw what happened to the primer paint upon heating. And if you keep the beam at 250 degrees centigrade, it starts cracking. And it's called mud cracks because it looks like what an African flood looks like in the summertime. If you heat it further to 650 degrees centigrade, the mud cracking becomes severe. And beyond that temperature, what happens is that your scales are being formed, which this is because the organic binder actually starts charring. There's no organic compounds which are stable, basically, beyond 450 degrees centigrade. But this is, uh, so it starts, it, is being converted to carbon and it starts peeling off. And this experiment has, you can carry on until 800, 900 degrees. I've done it myself. But these are pictures from the NIST report. So from looking at the mud cracking of the paint, they could tell how hot the steel beams had been. And I can tell you, this is footnote that they did not find any steel beams who had been beyond 250 degrees Celsius based on this ways of measuring. Okay, But what we are aiming at here is that what we found takes off at 430 degrees centigrade, but the primer paint is thermally stable. So that's why the red grade chips are not primer paint. No. This is an even greater magnification, uh, also an electron microscope picture of the red face, where we further can identify the particles involved here. We see some plate-like structures here. We see some smaller, but still crystalline, meaning that they are hard. And apparently some, what would you say? random face here, and this is, I can already now say, that this is the polymer, this is the plastic, because this material has the properties, it has the properties common with paint, uh, meaning that these particles here are embedded in a plastic matrix. I use the word plastic to make it simpler for you. A scientist would say a polymer matrix but maybe that is um, too far out. You see here the magnification here is 50,000. This is one micrometer. This is one thousandth of a millimeter. Further information we get if we are applying this energy dispersive spectroscopy to such a cutout of, of the um, close-up of, um, of the red face. This is an this is an electron microscope. This picture shows where the iron is. This picture shows where the aluminum is and where the oxygen is, where the silicon is, and where the carbon is. And, what, and there is some correlation. You can, for instance, see here that the aluminum is found in the same regions as the silicon. And we may already now get the impression or the idea, the information, that the aluminum and the silicon is located in these a flat, uh, what, should, what should we call flakes, uh, which, we see, which is seen here from the side, actually, while the iron and the oxide is located here in, in these small particles. And that is what it is. I can tell you already now. This, this white particle here is iron <coughs> oxide. Now, one 
very important point here is, is the aluminum bound to the silicon or isn't it? Because aluminum and silicon are very, very common elements in nature. It's so that the most common element on Earth is oxygen, number two is silicon, number three is aluminum, because they're omnipresent in stone, granite. But uh, we did an experiment where we dropped one chip at a time into what we, an organic solvent called methyl ethyl ketone. This, ladies, is almost the same as acetone, which you all know for removing of your uh, nail polish, right? So let's say it's acetone. It, does, it, it would work the same thing. But we use methyl ethyl ketone because it has a higher boiling point. It's easier to work with. Now, if you, if you drop one of these chips into methyl ethyl ketone, the red face swells. Like, a sponge, like if you put a dry sponge in water, it swells uh, five, al almost six times. And this is what you see here from the side of the red layer. This is an electron microscope's picture of the swollen chip. And now we're applying the same technology. We are asking, we are trying to map the chip according to elements. And the information you get here is that the aluminum distribution is now different from the silicon distribution, meaning that they cannot be bound together in a, in a chemical substance. If they were, they would not be separated. Furthermore, if we apply this energy dispersive spectroscopy to, an, to a silicon rich area like this one, we get a spectrum out like this, only silicon. Here, a little iron <coughs> oxide, because you cannot expect it to be completely, of course you see a little iron also. And if you apply it in an area where there's only aluminum, like here, you see you see aluminum and very little silicon. <coughs> this means that the silicon and the aluminum are in separate entities, and the aluminum can move around as a consequence of the swelling with the methyl ethyl ketone. This is an indirect but a good proof of that we have the presence of elemental aluminum, which is very, very important. But it is not the strongest evidence we have. The strongest evidence we have comes from the reactivity of these chips. Just a second. That's better here. Because when you heat these chips up, they react. It's not easy to show, uh, and uh, yeah. And um, what we're aiming at now is, you're already, you should know, we are talking about nanothermite, we're talking about the thermite reaction. <laughs> What I did is I set up a little instrument where I could basically control heat these chips. And I basically made up a little apparatus um, with a stainless steel heating strip that I could electrically control and heat just to the point where these chips would ignite because we know what their ignition temperature is based on other scientists work. So I can basically in a controlled manner bring these chips up to the ignition temperature, watch them ignite with my microscope and camera, and you're about to see one, um, and then go in and analyze what's happened after the chemical reaction, and that's what you're going to see here. But basically what happened is that chip uh, ignited and what you see, if, and we can go, anybody that actually wants to see it, we can watch it on the laptop over there afterwards, and I'd welcome you to do that. Uh, but basically what you're going to see is, on the left-hand side of that chip, you're going to see a sudden bright flash, white-hot flash, and you're going to then see a wave front move through the inside of the chip because it's so bright inside that it's actually radiating through the material that's still surrounding it. And you basically see a bright flash progressively move through that chip and then extinguish. So it moves from left to right and then extinguishes. And it's like, okay, you know, it's not overly spectacular, but, you know, something happened there. 
So this is basically that same chip afterwards, and it pretty much it puffed up, and you could see gas escaping from it. And so it's basically become porous on the outside with actually some holes that burst through for the gas to escape out. Um, and that's just the other side of the chip showing you again how it's you know been changed. What you find inside the chip after it burns, and what I'm pointing here, and you, again, you can't see them very well, but there's all these iron droplets now that have, you know, from the reaction have basically fallen to the bottom of the chip, and then when they cooled, they've solidified. So they're not perfect spheres. The spheres form, because we took, call them the microspheres, when a, a material is liquid and it falls through air, the only real force acting on it primarily is its own surface tension and so it tries to minimize that surface area actually and hence the surface energy and it goes into a sphere because that's the minimum surface area for a given volume of material and so you wind up with a sphere. Um, these don't form into perfect spheres. They're trying to, but when they hit something, they flatten out. But you basically wind up with all these metallic iron-based droplets that get formed inside the chip. And the other thing that they don't all form into ch droplets. The other interesting thing is, is as these are actually burning down through the chip or melting their way down through, they actually, along the walls, leave this very thin film of solidified iron. You know, whereas if you take these chips before you ignite them, and I've done it, just like I did where I said I exposed a fresh section, I've cut into these chips dozens, if not hundreds of times, and I've never found an iron microsphere inside. I've never found a film of iron inside. It's not there until the chip reacts. When the chip reacts, it produces molten iron, and you get that iron there. There's no iron, free iron. There's iron oxide before you ignite it. But there's no free iron inside these chips. It's only after it burns and it reacts that the thermite, you know, it's the same in the thermite grenade. If you open up a thermite grenade, you're not going to find any iron inside. It's not there. It's all tied up in the iron oxide. But after it reacts, there's plenty of iron.